Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. This is Ryan McMagan. I'm a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And joining me today is Joseph Solis Mullen. Joseph is a graduate student in economics at the University of Missouri. And I brought him on today because I want to talk a little bit about international aspects of U.S. monetary policy, about the value of the dollar, about where the dollar is headed. And Joseph's written quite a bit uh, on that topic, Mises.org, Power and Market, and especially in a recent article from the 13th called How the Fed Helped Create Another Calamity, the Ongoing Emerging Market Debt Crisis. So before we can speculate about what this means and uh, how this fits into to where we think things might be going in the future, Joseph, I think uh, we need you to explain a little bit about what is the importance of U.S. monetary policy in the global marketplace in terms of foreign debts, uh, foreign economies, the ability to pay off debts, all of that, because I think a lot of attention is paid to the central bank, usually on domestic issues, domestic recession, domestic inflation, all that. But there is that additional international dimension uh, that is very important. Uh, but maybe you can just share with us a little bit about uh, why that's important, why it matters, and what it means. So thank you for joining us uh, today. And uh, yeah, get us up to speed on what we need to know here. Sure, Ryan. I'd be happy to. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you liked the article as well. I got a lot of positive feedback on that. It is it is a topic that kind of flits in and out. Uh, it seems to pop up in the news every once in a while. Of course, students of economic history will remember that there were a lot of emerging market crises in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, and then in the in the wake of the, the great financial crisis, although we, we didn't tend to think about the peripheral, peripheral European borrowers in that way. But essentially what happens is developing markets usually have rather unstable currencies. And so in order to gain access to international credit markets, to international lenders, they'll issue debt denominated or they'll take on loans uh, denominated and paid in dollars or uh, their other currencies. It's, it's by far uh, dollars predominate, but you know, you'll get contracts written in, in pounds or yen or renminbi, but it's primarily dollars is, is what we're interested in. And this is where interest rates come in, because what predictably happens is during the low interest rate boom time, uh, countries take on debt. Uh, in, in this case, uh, a lot of the debt came uh, from outside the country. There aren't a lot of capital controls in a lot of places anymore. Markets tend to be very liquid, very volatile. And essentially what happens is you get essentially a run on the country. Uh, all the finance that has been there and that has been cheap and which has been available uh, in order to fund paying these debts disappears. And this creates a situation where the country is then faced with running down its central reserves. So the country will generally have res hard reserves. Uh, they call them hard reserves, but it's really just dollars and other currencies like that. Some of them do keep gold, but it's mostly just uh, dollars and things of that nature. But they'll run them down in an effort to either support their collapsing exchange rate with everyone exiting out of the currency or to pay imports. It, it runs out very quickly, as we saw in the case of Sri Lanka. Um, th those, those reserves run down very quickly uh, when, they're, when they're being pre pressured by international uh, financial markets. These countries are very small, and they're being buffeted by a tremendous amount of, of, of geopolitical catastrophes right now, shocks, um, deglobalization. Um, it's, it's been very difficult for them. It's been very difficult, and it's causing a lot of concern in places like Pakistan, for example, which is one of the countries that I highlight, where these, these, there, there are situations that could develop that could turn out very poorly for a lot of people elsewhere if they aren't handled. And I've been listening to a lot of the talk lately because it's starting to really come into the news that, oh, this, this could actually be, be a dangerous situation. So that's basically it. Uh, financing your debt, paying it in dollars. As the Fed has raised interest rates, that has cost foreign borrowers more and more and more in an effort to keep paying on these these debt instruments. And so if you were just observing uh, the U.S. domestically and looking at the dollar uh, in terms of in terms of just the dollar, right, to say the dollar of 10 years ago, you would be thinking, boy, uh, 
the dollar has really lost a lot of value, right? The dollar's inflating. Who's going to want the dollar? And I think that's a lot of the time where you hear a lot of predictions about uh, the dollar is collapsing and it's losing its value quickly. Well, that is true in a certain context. It's true that the dollar is much less value today than it does than it did 10 years ago. So the dollar 2022 is pretty weak compared to dollar 2001 or dollar 1990 or dollar 1950. The thing is, though, when we're in a world of free floating fiat currencies, mostly free floating in most parts of the world, not necessarily in China and some other big markets, but mostly free floating, is that it, it can be it's heavily affected by how it compares to other currencies. And this is a point we have made uh, before, which is that the dollar could potentially be uh, <laughs> the last major currency standing if other banks keep what keep uh, other central banks keep doing what they've been doing. because as bad as the Fed has been on monetary policy, inflating the money supply, buying up huge amounts of assets, keeping interest rates super, super low, financial repression, all of that, other central banks have been just as bad, if not worse. So you look at the behavior of the European Central Bank, uh, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, none of these other central banks inspire much confidence. So uh, when you've got the U.S. raising interest rates, doing a little bit to uh, mitigate the price inflation and the money supply inflation, that's going on, that makes the dollar look relatively good compared to a lot of these other currencies where they have similar problems and are maybe even taking fewer steps uh, to really prop up the value of the dollar. So yes, the, the dollar is being devalued, but in terms of international comparisons, it's actually holding its value and it may be even increasing and heading toward sort of a strong dollar situation in the international field. And then the problem is that what you encounter isn't just the paying off of debts, but then foreign exchange, obtaining foreign exchange for some of these countries. So you mentioned Sri Lanka, right? Is if they're losing value, um, they're going to have a hard time importing things from countries that have better and stronger currencies uh, relative to the Sri Lankan currency, which I don't even know what it's called. Um, maybe the Sri Lankan rupee? I don't know. And so then they have a hard time importing things. And so I assume then this is an additional element, Joseph, where not only is it a debt issue, but if the local currency is being greatly inflated and it's not comparing well to foreign currencies, they could even potentially get into not just debt repayment issues, but just the ability to import vital supplies. is That's an issue also in Sri Lanka, right? And in some of these other places. That's absolutely correct. And it's, it's, it's especially dangerous, I think, in Pakistan, where you're seeing one of the most serious political crises in the, in the country's history right now playing out. And you also have rolling blackouts. They can't get their, their orders for natural gas filled. There's obviously a a lot of focus on how much natural gas Europe is storing away right now. And that's been something that's been watched very closely and it's been celebrated how well they've been doing. But one thing that's often ignored, just as you say, monetary policy is generally looked at in terms of how it will affect the United States. What's not being looked at is how it's affecting countries like Pakistan who are simply being outbid by wealthy European countries who need other natural gas. So things like grain as well, the, the disruptions to the global food supply, um, it's all been very bad. And uh, of course, one of the, the things that really hurt Sri Lanka was um, the, and I had written an article about this, but was kind of the forced move away from petrochemical fertilizer uh, agriculture that was kind of painted as this um, sort of uh, very far-sighted shift toward a greener policy, but was really just because their foreign reserves were under pressure already last year. As I said, this was kind of something that's been a long way coming. And it's it simply, it was too much of a drain to pay for those imports already. And that was when the dollar was significantly weaker than it is now. And it's going to continue to strengthen. I think um, the inflation report really dashed a lot of the late summer hopes that maybe you'd seen the peak, that maybe the Fed was going to start talking about. The, the talk prior to the reading, uh, I think it was Tuesday, was you know half point or three quarters point. 
Now it's three quarters point. Would they go a whole point? Um, I, I think there's every reason to believe that they're going to stay hawkish for the time being. And that bodes very ill for all of these countries, because at the same time that the Federal Reserve is marching in one direction, the G7, who really should be the ones coordinating uh, a lot of these situations where you need debt restructuring, uh, it's just not a priority. It's just not a priority. Again, geopolitics really getting in the way of just coming up with a framework where some of these debts can be uh, either written down, restructured, rescheduled. I find it interesting that when you read about it in the papers, in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, Washington Post, the major papers, they always make sure to mention that China is, a, is the biggest bilateral lender to a lot of these countries and how the loans are very opaque and the Chinese uh, you know, don't want to play ball with the IMF and stuff. So far, it's been the Chinese who have been willing to uh, engage in restructuring and write downs. And it's been private Western creditors who have been unwilling uh, to take haircuts. And it's it's playing very unpopularly. Uh, I was actually uh, tuning into a, a conference the London School of Economics was hosting and a couple of Indian economists were speaking. And they said flat out that they just think that this is another reason why uh, U.S. dollar hegemony needs to be ended. Um, because if there were some sort of other international rebalancing mechanism, these sorts of things would never occur. But they're they're essentially angry that a lot the lar a large proportion of the spending that's happened in the last couple of years, but it, in terms of GDP, has been done by the developed countries, and a lot of them are now complaining that essentially you had uh, private Western creditors pitching them on low interest rates forever that we were in a new normal and that funding these dollar liabilities was always going to be as cheap as it is now, uh, going back to the, you know, real negative rates, um, QE infinity years. And, and now they feel like they've been sold a bill of goods and that, uh, they're being hung out to dry at the same time. They're being asked to choose sides in a war that they don't want to choose sides over, uh, that's caused food shortages and fuel supplies and really destabilized a lot of countries. So it's a very negative situation. And again, it's, it's something that's happened repeatedly. So in the 90s, when it occurred in East Asia, it was happening against a very different geopolitical backdrop than it is now. So I think that's probably why there's a lot more uh, intensity and focus around it for, for those policymakers who are studying it. Well, I do want to come back to the dollar hegemony question in a minute. Um, first, I want you to explain a little bit more about why that's even an issue. And, and what I mean by that is, why do these countries borrow in dollars? We talked about they do, and it's and it has implications. But why do they have to? Why don't they just pursue a strong dollar policy of their own? Why do they devalue their currencies? Why why do they have a currency that's uh, that can't stand on its own and requires them to borrow in dollars? And and you note in your article that that's less so today than it was in the past, but uh, clearly still a major issue in many cases. So what are, the, what are the political or economic reasons about why so many of these countries have weakening or weak currencies in the first place? Well, credit markets run on, on confidence to a certain degree. And so when you have an emerging market borrower, there's, uh, not, a track, there's not usually the same track record. There, there tends to be a lot of sporadic bouts of inflation. Um, and so as a, as, a, as a protection for themselves, creditors will demand that, 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 that the loan be in dollars, that it will only be offered in dollars. A lot of governments and private corporations already knowing that and wanting access to global credit markets uh, will, will just write them in dollars to begin with in order to attract investors. Uh, as I said in the article and as you just alluded to, that's becoming less, less so the case, but we're talking about a, a change in, in, in terms of several percent. Uh, it's still the case that these even things like contracts are, are written overwhelmingly in dollars because it's had a history of being a fairly stable currency. As you said earlier, it's, it's a relative question. Even though the dollar is relatively much weaker than it was 50 years ago, in a relative sense right now, because of other conditions that are going on, it's actually being viewed as, as a safe haven, which, is, which it traditionally has been. You referenced some of the, the, the real culprits there in terms of the ECB. Uh, the Bank of Japan. The, J the Bank of Japan was probably predictable. Uh, the ECB, I think a lot of more fiscally conservative voters who had supported the European project will be very disappointed to see how things have gone uh, over the last 10 years to see that it's now basically just aping the Federal Reserve, but it doesn't have the same uh, 
basically power that the Federal Reserve can draw on. The U.S. economy is, is a tremendous thing. It's the most powerful economy that's ever existed. So when the Fed does things like engage in credit facilities and things like that, which emerging market central banks are starting to ape as well, which is really a dangerous thing to do because they don't have as much constant demand for dollars. So pressing on the debt monetization lever in a less sophisticated and less uh, wide ranging and deep pool of potential buyers is, is extremely dangerous. But it, there, there's not a lot that these that these borrowers can do. They're running up uh, into the reality. I, I believe it's 58 countries now are ha, have payments on just the interest on their debt exceeding 5% of GDP. And that's considered by the IMF to be like flashing warning lights, you know. Uh, so we're, we're in a very bad situation there. And again, it's, it's a question of do you want access uh, to global credit markets, especially because the dollar has been so cheap to borrow relatively over the last decade because of central bank interference in the bond markets. It really created a situation where uh, even, even among American investors in domestic equities, there was a real resistance to believing that inflation was back, that the, that the forever zero and negative re real rates was just going to go on forever, even though it was really just a product of a moment. Um, and we are going to be shifting hard in the other direction. And of course, a lot depends on how other actors within the system behave. Certainly, a country could try to, to run a harder currency. There's just going to be a limit to how much borrowing you're going to be able to access. Over time, theoretically, if you kept your exchange rate stable, didn't inflate the value of it, eventually you would attract borrowers. Uh, I mean, countries who are very high credit risk today who don't do that can still borrow in a lot of cases. They just have to borrow at very high rates. So it's just a question of how of, of optimizing your borrowing rates, which is um, what they were doing. They were using short term debt to, you know, pay interest payments and things like that, which is something you can manage in a low interest rate environment. But everything was very delicately, delicately balanced. And the combination of COVID and the supply chain disruptions and the deglobalization and the sanctions and the war, it's, it's just wreaking havoc with, with what was really a, a really finely tuned, hyper-globalized, hyper-financialized system. Yeah, I might note, of course, uh, similar to this, in the olden days, you would write up contracts where the, the debt needed to be repaid in gold or... Uh, if if the dollar had lost a certain amount of value, then you had to, then you had to resort to gold in those cases. It was it was an attempt to hedge the the problem you might encounter of an inflating currency. So you just so you would have gold as your backup, whereas in this case you just use dollars as your backup because that's believed to be more stable in many cases. And in many cases, it still is more stable than some of these even worse currencies. It just it's it doesn't appear stable when you're when you're comparing it to the dollars you held uh, ten years ago, but. I want to move then toward the issue of, of we do seem to be maybe hitting an inflection point here in terms of the global monetary order. And just to emphasize what you just said a minute ago in terms of just how much things have been going back and forth and changing with the global economy uh, because of COVID and the lockdowns and all that, right? It wasn't all that long ago where, well, it was about 2021, right? So in 2021, we, we were reading articles about how the... Uh, the emerging markets, third world, whatever you want to call it, we don't really call it that anymore, uh, emerging markets, developing world, uh, was, was toast, basically, because, uh, because of the economic collapse that occurred and all of the logistical problems that had come out of the lockdowns. Uh, these countries were in deep, deep trouble, and there might even be famines. And then uh, after, after all that money printing in the developed world really set in and demand just surged through the roof and commodity markets just exploded for a while. Then suddenly you had all these wealthy countries buying up commodities left and right. And so then we were reading articles about how uh, emerging markets were actually doing pretty all right and even their currencies were being strengthened and, and things for now were okay. But now that we've uh, started to finally recognize that inflation is a problem in these countries that printed all this money, scaling that back, finally starting to uh, ease the foot off the accelerate a little bit of money growth in Europe and the U.S., well, now all that money isn't flowing into the emerging markets like it was. So now we're reading articles about how these countries 
are in deep, deep trouble, even to the point where it's not even all emerging countries. I'm just reading today on how Japan is, in, to a certain extent, throwing in the towel on, on maintaining the value of their currency. And while they're, they're going to attempt some manipulation that recognizes that the, the yen is likely to fall significantly in value against the dollar. And as a result, now that they're desperate for dollars, um, and and foreign wealth, they're they're actually even opening their uh, their borders to visitors for the first time in years. Uh, where uh, before, basically, you just couldn't get into Japan, even if you were a resident there and you had left and you wanted to get back. So this is forcing Japan to to change some of their policies there, and that's not even a poor country. Um, but you could see then how emerging market countries in bad shape now that things aren't going well. Now that they're looking at situations where they really might not be able to pay off the debts, they're going to really start, I think, looking around for some way to change the monetary order, right? If if they can't get dollars, that's a big problem for them in terms of getting petroleum, right? Because of the petrodollar, which, well, is in uh, Russia and China managed to put some dents into that whole system. It's still pretty much a big factor. And so you could see big motivation there where... We have some currency other than dollars that we could use for our debts. That would put more pressure on the U.S. maybe to come to the negotiating table then, because then we'll just say, well, we just won't borrow in dollars ever again now. And finding some way to get around the petrodollar. I mean, there are lots of reasons why these emerging markets might want to do that. And it's hard to get a sense of how far that's coming along or because articles often either overstated or understated. I mean, in your opinion, how far down are we that road? Are we down that road? Uh, uh, what what are the prospects for any sort of short or medium term change in the global monetary uh, organization or in the order? Well, it's such a it's such an interesting question. And, and as you say, people tend to be very passionate one way or the other. And it, it comes out in a lot of the analysis. I think based on what we can see so far, as you said, there there have been uh, developments over the last eight months, uh, as one might expect. Prior to that, uh, about 3% uh, of transactions were being settled in, in renminbi, uh, a handful of percent in things like, uh, you know, yen, although I'm sure that's going to fall, as you were just referencing. It's been overwhelmingly a, a dollar system for a lot of the reasons that we talked about. Um, so a lot's going to depend on adoption and utility. And as you said, if, if dollars are more expensive to get, uh, you may see more countries adopting uh, alternatives. Uh, in the case of China, one of the things that I think is interesting is because I think in part uh, due to the lack of uh, you know any kind of civil civil liberties uh, protections there they're they're really moving full speed ahead with with a, a digital yuan and uh, apart from any kind of uh, ability to supervise uh, the population I think one of the tremendous advantages that it conveys uh, on Beijing in terms of uh, shifting the monetary order more in its favor is that uh, tremendous parts of the world still have no access to conventional banking. So they, they have cell phones, smartphones have proliferated. But th what the Chinese uh, policymakers are doing is making it possible for uh, farmers, you know, all sorts of people. And there, there are other options as well. But the thing about a, a central bank currency is there's going to be an expectation that debts are going to be made whole, especially uh, in China, where so much of the system, uh, so much of the financial system uh, pretty much just explicitly depends on, uh, you know, the, the, the central government stepping in to make sure everyone gets what they're supposed to get. Um, that being said, the United States, the dollar, it, it has a lot of built-in advantages, as you were referencing the petrodollar. In times of global instability like this, uh, if you have a large amount of uh, a large amount of capital, where are you going to tuck it necessarily um, and, and find some some yield? Uh, it's very hard to find any, uh, and especially when you look at the United States. It, it looks relatively safe uh, compared to, to a lot of the other options, um, because, of course, there is no guarantee that, for example, China won't wind up being the target of a range 
of even more intensive financial sanctions. And so I, I think there, there are a lot of moving pieces to it. I think the fact that the dollar is strengthening right at the moment when so many other central banks are stumbling or and China's economy is moving precisely the wrong direction, in part because they continue to embrace a very draconian COVID policy. Uh, I mean, just it's, it's quite, quite crazy uh, to see how they've persisted with their zero COVID policy, despite all the evidence that's, that's built up that it's just hamstringing them tremendously. Uh, but so, no, and with, with China's uh, financial system being so intertwined as the United States' was with the, the property sector and China's property sector still being so uncertain, uh, I think it's it's going to remain the case, at least over the short term, that the dollar will remain pretty entrenched. Um, it may lose share as countries look to settle commodities and avoid the dollar. Uh, that, that could definitely happen, uh, especially if Saudi Arabia continues to uh, move in the other direction, let's say. I think they've, they've finally come around to the fact that um, they actually hold the whip hand in the relationship um, because the U.S. basically just doesn't, the U.S. planners just simply don't want to alienate or otherwise ir- irritate them um, because they think that it uh, you know, selling them weapons and, uh, you know, doing things for them is, is going to make them uh, compliant in the same way that they were 40 years ago. Um, I, I think, I think, <laughs> I think that's a it's a foolish policy, and I think Joe Biden's recent visit has has demonstrated that as clearly as anyone needed to see. So it's it's unclear how long the U.S. will maintain the kind of control that it's had. But at the same time, again, a, a lot of it depends on the trajectories of other countries. China's economy, in my view, is at or near its peak. Its population is already probably past its peak. So it's and they just don't have open capital accounts. There's a lot of opacity. Uh, even more financial repression. Um, it's so the dollar just there's not a good alternative to the dollar. Essentially, uh, as you said, it's a relative question, and I just think the dollar enjoys a lot of advantages, and it is experiencing this crisis at a moment when there aren't a lot of good alternatives. What do you think this all means for the euro, though? I think that's that's what's been one of the more difficult questions. I mean. <sighs> Ten years ago, you I think you saw a lot of articles about how the euro was really challenging the dollar and could overtake it anytime soon. You don't see much of that anymore. Um, the euro and the, the ECB is still so wedded to, uh, to weak euro policy, essentially, um, that it, it doesn't seem like it's going to be rivaling the dollar. The question is, is, could it cause a real crisis? Uh, in Europe, could could you see a could you see an actual reduction in the eurozone? Where you had Italy leave, uh, a reduction to a Northern Europe monetary block, uh, or will it just go on being second fiddle and it'll just be the second strongest currency somehow and will continue? Uh, and will it then, though, not be able to expand as it has in, in previous years? It seems like it's not nearly as good a deal when you're Poland to enter the Eurozone as it might have appeared to be 20 years ago, especially if you want to maintain some con- some local control over your own monetary policy. And so we, we often look at this in terms of the dollar, but I just wonder what it means for the euro overall. And if the euro starts to course go into decline, that would seem to, to really help the dollar even more. Uh, but it's really hard to guess right now. I guess it'll de- decide it'll depend a little bit maybe on the state of the the Italian economy five years from now. I don't know what that's going to look like. Uh, but is but is there any real threat there or is it just going to be another also ran? It'll be all right and it'll keep chugging along. The original euro was conceived as a competitor to the dollar as a store of value. And the ECB was modeled after the Bundesbank, uh, the very tight fiscal operation that the Germans had been running. And essentially what happened is the Germans under Merkel uh, basically folded in the face of the Eurozone crisis. And uh, essentially now it's, it's simply a political instrument. It is a way of keeping the Euro together. And so the ultra soft policy is a way of subsidizing the weaker members. Uh, who are in the euro. 
And uh, when you look at Europe, the individual European countries, one, one thing that stands out to you is demographic decline, lack of total factor productivity growth, and very, uh, you know, unimpressive growth rates. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of regulation, uh, in, in a lot of taxes in a lot of cases. Uh, it's just not a situation that, that, that is going to propel a dynamic economy forward. There's no reason to think that um, it's, it's going to be a challenger to a much demographically and economically more healthy United States, uh, which is food and energy independent. It's a net exporter. Europe is not in either case. So it's going to be a case by case basis. But essentially, now that the ECB uh, was basically turned into a, a kind of a carbon copy of uh, the Federal Reserve. And of course, there are still pending challenges to things like, uh, for example, the ECB is going to cap the spreads between borrowers uh, this winter um, because they suspect, for example, Italy's um, borrowing costs are going to start to rise relative to other borrowers. Well, this is a tremendous subsidy and it's a tremendous stick with which you can keep potentially uh, anti-European integrationist parties in line with. You saw this in Italy, actually, where it was looking very, very likely, uh, even three, four months ago, that a right coalition was going to come into power and were they going to play ball with Brussels? Well, then, uh, you know, the ECB started hinting that they had a way to keep down Italy's borrowing costs. And, you know, end of July, um, the the coalition announced that they were going to follow the, the, the EU's uh, directives. And then they unveiled this big scheme where they're going to, you know, get billions of dollars and they're going to have caps for their debt and all of this other stuff. So as long as the ECB holds uh, the whip hand, which it does, and it increasingly is using its power of credit facilities, credit facilities, which um, going all the way back to Draghi, actually, he had wanted to be able to do QE just like Bernanke and company were doing there because he recognized that it was a way uh, through softer monetary policy um, to just keep borrowing costs down and to um, basically politically settle uh, what was becoming a very turbulent and fractious uh, EU political landscape. Um, this, was, of course, was when, when Brexit was, was heating up. So I don't think the euro is, is going to displace the dollar. I think you're, the EU will be lucky to, to stay intact. I know that's, that's been something that people always say, ah, you know, the, it always pulls through these crises. I mean, it's like a 25-year-old. I mean, obviously, you can go back to the coal and steel community, but really the euro trying to have a currency regime with independent fiscal policies and, and all sorts of, of different levels of control. It's, it's quite a complicated project. And if there had been no uh, if, if Russia had been able to be integrated peaceably into that and constructively into that and had just been able to serve as Europe's gas station, uh, I think everything could have turned out much differently, but it didn't. And I think now Europe is going to be stuck in, in the United States' uh, uh, shadow there, certainly in terms of monetary policy and economically and probably geopolitically as well. Yeah, the uh, the euro always holds together until it doesn't, right? I mean, <laughs> the Soviet Union was fine until it wasn't. Uh, I mean, this is true of, of any political entity, Right. So it's just a, based on 25 year old track record as uh, not exactly especially impressive. That's a lot less than we got from the Soviets and they just disappeared essentially overnight. So, yeah, it's not like it couldn't happen. I mean, of course, as someone who uh, is not a big fan of immense amounts of power residing in the U.S. Central Bank, what you need is, until you can abolish the Fed and really majorly reform the monetary system you need some other global currencies that can really put up some real competition for the dollar so that in real terms, you have some sort of real global currency competition, which would restrain then the bank, uh, the, the Fed, because it couldn't just print up as much money as it wanted, trusting to the fact that everybody would need to buy up dollars globally as the reserve currency. But it doesn't look like I'm going to get my wish in the short term, at least, because it just doesn't seem like things are going in that direction. Uh, but fortunately, it seems that there's enough domestic pressure just on domestic inflation to force the Fed to uh, to ease off the monetary uh, <laughs> the monetary expansion a little bit. But you know, I don't know how much faith I have in uh, 
in their ability to stave off the pivot for any significant amount of time. Uh, once the inflate, once the recessionary data starts coming in, I don't know what's going to happen. But the thing is, is that if there's a, re a recession in the U.S., there's going to be a recession in Europe, most likely as well, and in the emerging in the emerging markets. And then they're going to start just spending uh, to cover their recessionary problems. They're going to start spending a stimulus and then inflate their currencies again. So again, the dollar doesn't seem to be the worst off. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for your comments today. It seems that uh, in the short term, at least, there's a lot going in the dollar's favor. And so we'll just have to keep an eye on and see uh, if, if anything changes there. Uh, but I'm not seeing a whole lot on the horizon, even if everything goes well in terms of collaboration between Russia and China. That's just that's that's a long term sort of project. So uh, thank you again, Joseph for joining me today. Thank you all for listening to Radio Rothbard, and we'll see you next time.